Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Bramasol's ongoing series of webinars around various finance transformation and finance compliance pro processes. Uh, today, we're going to talk about ASC 842. So you filed your Q1 reports, now what? Uh, joining us today will be Julio de la Costa, John Scott, and Kerry Peterson. So without further ado, we're going to get moving here. Uh, as always, I want to encourage everybody to engage with us throughout the conversation. You can do that here in the questions box on your screen uh, and certainly ask questions throughout the webinar. Uh, as always, please feel free to ask any question. Those that we can answer about can you, uh, we are certainly uh, open to doing that. For those of you who are asking more how-to questions or details will follow up with you later on. The opportunity here to go to bramasol.com, check out our resource page by clicking up here in the upper right. Uh, join us at Sapphire. You can click this registration. You can learn more about the different uh, talks that we're going to be giving at Sapphire. And finally, if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, uh, you can see here's today's webinar, and you can learn more about some of our previous webinars. So with that in mind, let's cover the agenda real quick. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about ASC 842 and IFRS 16 background. Uh, we'll talk about some recommended disclosures and requirements, give some actual examples uh, so you can see what they're going to look like. One of the big concepts that's been resonating with people as Julio and I and others have been going out uh, on our various talks at SAP Centric, SAP Insider, and other places is this concept of day two. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about day two, and then we'll hear from Kerry about SAP CLM integration, uh, the look of simplification. Uh, so we've, we are going to talk to you a little bit about uh, how SAP CLM really simplifies the whole uh, processes. And then finally, we'll do some leasing key takeaways. Uh, we'll also talk to a member of our team, John Scott, uh, CPA and member of my technical team, uh, accounting team, John has extensive experience uh, on a number of different projects, and John will be sharing some of his uh, insights. So with that, Julio, I'm going to turn it over to you to kick us off on to what's, so what's the big deal here, Julio, with the leasing standards, uh, and we'll take it from there. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Good day, everyone. This is Julio Dallacosta. So, John, this is an exciting time for all us accountants because We've been working on ASC 842 for the last three or four years, and now is the time. Q1 has passed, and public companies are rushing towards preparing and disclosing what the new financial footnote under ASC 842 will look like. So for public companies, 1119 was the deadline, and for private companies, we have one more year. So this is all new for new companies, and we're going to show you what that actually means. On this screen here, what you're looking at is, it's not just an accounting change. There are a number of holistic impacts, including new accounting processes, training of not just the accounting staff, but operation staff as well, understanding what sort of solutions are available, and don't forget about disclosures. You go through all the projects, you do the new accounting, the new accounting processes, and now you have to tell, public companies have to tell their investors, what have we done? And what do the new numbers look like? So that will all include your requirements from a technical accounting perspective, from a systems perspective, and from a process perspective. Next. So three critical areas when we talk about disclosures. So we're going to talk about what you've already done. So you've already abstracted your leases. You've already done your accounting changes. You've correctly identified your lease population. Remember, we have known leases, and we also have embedded leases. Once you've done that, you've now correctly accounted. There's a new accounting model under ASC 842 where you have a combination of lease expense con con considering the interest expense as well as depreciation amortization all bundle up into one straight line lease expense. 
Now the last step is really you have to comply with disclosures. We have all the disclosure reporting points that is all new to these companies. And we're going to show you that in the next slide. So on page 121 of the FASB guidance, this is what the FASB has recommended for new companies to actually disclose their data points under ASC 842. On the top side of the screen, it will be all your P&L income statement impacts, where you're going to talk about what is your lease cost for your finance and operating leases, what is your short-term lease cost, what is your variable lease cost, and if you have sublease income, you also have to disclose that as a credit to that expense items. In the middle of the screen, you're required to disclose all your cash flow impacts. So what is my cash paid for my operating leases? What is my cash paid for my finance leases? Then you're going to do, as we've done under 840, what is your right of use exchanges? Any non-cash impacts, such as exchanges, you will have to disclose. At the bottom of the screen, you will see the new requirements for all companies, which is your weighted average calculations. You're going to have to do your weight average calculations for your lease term, for your portfolio of leases, as well as your IBRs, incremental borrowing rates, across your portfolios of finance and operating leases. What I thought would be helpful is that we have here the recommended FASB guidance. What we did is we've been looking at all the filings, all the SEC filings for various public companies. and w Granger just filed their 10Q a couple of days ago. And here on the screen here is what you see is their new financial footnote for 842. As we've been talking about in our previous webinars, the first part of your requirement is you're going to talk about your qualitative points. It's going to tell you about your lease portfolio. As you can see on the screen, they're talking about the kind of properties they have, the buildings. They're going to talk about all their different practical experience. So give you a real nice view of what is my lease portfolio look like? And how did we account for them under the new standard? Next. Now we get into what we just showed you before. We had the FASB recommended guidance and now we have the actual quantitative data points. So the first part of the screen is, because Granger is such a large company, you will not see on your face of your financials where they have their other leases uh, categorized. Therefore, as part of the FASB requirement, you're obliged to show where are you putting RU assets and RU liabilities. So on the screen here, what you see is they've included RU assets in other assets, and they've included our uh, liabilities in other um, current accrued expenses and other non-current liabilities. As we know, there's a 10% SEC rule. So if your line items are not more than 10%, you are allowed to categorize this within other assets and other liabilities, as you've seen Granger done. The next piece of this part is you have, or we talked about earlier, is your weighted average remaining lease term. For the three months ended, um, March 31st, 2019, you have six years, and then you have the weighted average incremental borrowing rate, 2.5. One point I wanted to bring up here is that, as we saw in the FASB guidance, and we saw in 606, you would have normally seen two reporting periods. You would have seen March 31st, 2019, compared to March 31st, 2018. This is the reason why you're only seeing one period is because Granger opted to select the practical expedient which says you are allowed to continue your ASC 840 legacy accounting up until 1231 2018 and then you flip on the switch and do 842. Therefore, if you did a comparative, it would be all under 840. There would be no 842 impact. So they actually took the transition uh, practical expedient where they would basically run 840 until the end of 2018. So therefore, you're only seeing one uh, period of reporting. Going back to the disclosures here, you would see that they included their rent expense in SG&A of 19 million, 
and then going back to the cash paid for operating leases, which 17 million, which we talked about, that's the cash flow impact. And then we have a non-cash flow impact disclosure, which is they have actually identified an exchange of RU assets obtained in exchange for operating lease obligations, which is a non-cash disclosure that has to be disclosed under the new guidance. Next. And this is actually, should not be too different from ASC 840. As we recall, under previous accounting, we had the commitments and contingencies footnote. ASC 842 requires the maturity analysis, which is very similar to the previous commitments and contingency schedule, which shows basically the present value of their lease liabilities, which they reported at 195 million, and it shows the five-year maturity of when these are scheduled to be paid out. And then obviously, you know, at the last line item, they are saying that as of March 31st, the future operating lease obligations that have not commenced are immaterial. Next slide. So Julio, one of the things that we talked about is everybody has software packages and everybody thought about day one. I can comply day one. But now, what about day two, and what do you do from a systems, processes, and accounting perspective, day two? Yes, John. So, exactly, John. So, as we know, there are usually three different uh, critical areas that you have to look when you adopt a new accounting standard, whether it be ASC 606, RevRec, or ASC 842. There's always the systems, there's the business process, and what we like to call, which, which includes the accounting, and the last piece is really the people aspect of it, the training, the change management aspect of those changes. So we're going to go through some of the challenges because, you know, most people would say, okay, I can do the present value calculations in Excel or any system can do it. But what we really wanted to talk about is once you've done those calculations and you start your reporting, what's next? What are some of the key areas that you need to consider as you roll out from day one, which is you capitalize your right of use asset, you capitalize and you uh, book on your balance sheet your liabilities. What do you do next? Here are some of the considerations that you should think about as you move forward in this process. You know, one of the key, key important pieces of this is really systems, you know. With the demands of quarterly financial statement reporting, you know, some companies are finding that the systems they chose cannot produce all the needed accounting entries, or disclosures, or even more importantly, the internal management reporting. Usually you find if your team is booking entries manually or patching interfaces, further integration and optimization of your lease accounting system and the processes around it will greatly facilitate a more efficient and well-controlled compliance process going forward. Companies always have to remember that when you talk about accounting, you're not talking about just the accounting business process, but let's don't forget our good old friend Sarbanes-Oxley. Whenever you transition to a new accounting standard and you re-engineer your business processes for the new accounting, Sarbanes-Oxley plays a very important role, and you have to make sure that your new business processes have the correct controls, whether it be system, automated, or manual controls in that new accounting process. The next piece, and a lot of people have had issues with this, is your account payable system integration. What you find is in the race to implement, Many companies have postponed integration of their accounting system, including their accounts payable system with the new enterprise lease accounting system. Now that compliance is achieved, efficiency gains such as enabling seamless data transfer from leasing invoices and disbursements between systems has to be reviewed. Companies will need to examine their processes for generating payment schedules and facilitate an interface between an outsourced accounts payable function and the new lease system. Mm -hmm. Consider how this will work operationally. 
through either a centrally managed function or a more distributed model. We always ask companies that we've helped to implement ASC 842 is, are you going to have a centralized process or decentralized process? Because both has its own set of challenges. Some organizations have also gone a step further to consider how they want their lease management processes to integrate with their overall contract management system. We have seen companies keep their lease management software and then implement another software to perform the accounting. Clearly, these two systems need to talk to each other or companies you know, may want to consider a more holistic solution such as the SAP CLM, where REFX has been around for the last 20 years and then more recently added the ASC 842 and IFS 16 functionality. The next piece of the challenge as companies you know, implement ASC 842 IFS 16 is you talk about software upgrades and regression testing. Enhancing enterprise lease accounting systems is proving very challenging for many companies with a wide-ranging new standard very and a pressured adoption time frame many systems are still evolving and may require frequent updates keeping up with system patches while remaining in compliance may require combined business and IT strategy that balances frequent patch releases extensive testing and business operations. John, anything you wanted to comment on that, these three? No, absolutely. Uh, Julio, you kind of, you absolutely, you know, we talk a lot and I've been on many of the same calls with you, hit the nail on the head. I think from a robustness, I think you'd agree that one of the couple of key places we see challenges are in, in the uh, foreign exchange uh, where systems are not keeping record of or are integrated and so you have differences between the foreign exchange rates that may be in your uh, existing system uh, versus uh, the ones that are in your leasing system. And so reconciling those, and, and of course there's many different levels. The other one of course is things like 445 calendars uh, or non-fiscal calendars. A lot of the systems are not able to support that. And certainly from a disclosures perspective, um, not all your data is going to come from one system all the time, depending on how you've integrated. Um, and that goes to your accounts payable, right? Um, and then finally, yep, software updates, regression testing. Um, but I would also encourage people, and, and you and I heard this earlier today uh, mm -hmm. on a couple of different calls, SOC, so SOC and SOCs. Um, when you have an integrated system like CLM and SAP, um, it's in there. Um, when you have other systems, you really need to go back and uh, evaluate how they're going to manage the SOC and SOCs integrations and the SOCs uh, from a compliance perspective. So absolutely. Yes, very important. <laughs> Some of the challenges we're going to talk about, controls. Always don't forget about controls. For many, the laser focus on adoption relegated controls to the back burner. As we talked about, Sarbanes-Oxley is always there, especially for public companies. Effective risk management requires the right controls and processes in areas such as product documentation, system access, accuracy and completeness of data extraction and testing, systematic controls, and configurable controls. Organizations that have not really discussed the new leasing standard with their auditors will want to address any questions about controls early especially with regard to the new systems. Companies may also want to undertake a controls assessment of the entire leasing environment, including a close look at automated versus manual controls. We have seen many of our customers require SOC reports type 2 for internal controls assessments as well as system controls. It's very important because for the auditors, for your external auditors to sign off on this, they will need to get comfortable that the accounting is not only correct, but there are proper controls embedded within the systems. The next piece challenge is lease identification. You know, as companies observe during the transition process, contracts not traditionally thought of as leases may be in scope for the new guidance. Companies will therefore need to monitor new contracts on an ongoing basis to determine if they're in scope of the standard. 
This may require new processes as well as raising awareness with other business functions such as procurement or corporate development. Judgment may also be necessary to determine where certain contracts such as outsourced warehousing, data management, and supply arrangement require capitalization. This is a very important point because the concept of embedded leases was never really thought about before. Under 840, you get a lease, you debit expense, you credit cash, and you move on. I think this is what I talk about when I talk about the P, the, the three P's. One of the three P's is people and training of not just the accounting staff, but usually leases happen in the warehousing and operational staff. And we need to have trainings for accounting as well as operational staff to make sure that they're aware that if you're going to lease a tractor or a forklift, that may have an embedded lease in it. It may have embedded leases within areas such as uh, data management. If you have a server from a vendor and that server is being exclusively provided to you to provide services to your organization, that could be in cases be what we call an embedded lease and you may actually have to capitalize that even though you have a service agreement. So it's very important that the people aspect, the training aspect is rolled out not just to the accounting staff but also to the operational staff. The last one on this slide is really the remeasurement events. In certain situations, a lessee may require to remeasure its liability and adjust its lease asset, as well as reconsider allocation and classification. A lessee should monitor any events that may change its initial determination around whether it would exercise a lease extension, a termination, or purchase options. Examples may include significant leasehold improvements or significant modifications to the underlying asset. Always remember that you know once you set up the amortization schedule in your system, if something changes, and usually in lease environments, it always changes, it may cause you to remeasure the, the lease. And that may cause you to have to rerun a new amortization schedule in your system and rebook the adjustments. Next slide. Let's not forget about impairment. A lessee's right to use is subject to the same asset impairment guidance in ASC 360 applied to other elements of PP&E. This will be a significant change to current practice and application may vary based on facts and circumstances. Further, once a right of use asset associated with an operating lease is impaired, lease expense will no longer be recognized on a strict line basis demanding a change to the expense calculation process. This is very important because just like we do for asset impairment, you now have to add in another category, which is your ROU asset. And once it's impaired, the lease expense actually becomes detangled de from the straight line accounting. So you're going to have to do some serious technical accounting assessments for an impairment of an ROU. Next piece we talk about is sale leaseback. Typically in a sale leaseback transaction, the new guidance requires that both the seller and buyer evaluate whether a sale in fact occurred from an accounting perspective. This assessment, which is less prescriptive than legacy guidance and now includes the lessor, is predicated on when there was a transfer of control. Remember 606, ASC 606 revenue recognition? and the related interconnections between the two standards, where you start analyzing an ASC 606, but it may lead you to ASC 842. As we all know, ASC 842 trumps ASC 606. So the whole concept of transfer of control, which actually is from ASC 606, now comes into play in ASC 842. So while certain terms may preclude a certain control was transferred, such as where a lessee holds a fixed purchase price option under, on the underlying asset, the impact of other terms may require judgment, such as a fair value purchase option. In light of the judgment required, some companies may prefer, where possible, not to take title to an asset they intend to lease. However, having said that, even where a lessee does not take title to the asset, 
if it obtains a fixed price purchase option, it may still need to consider if it substantially obtained control over the asset. So I wanted to show the audience today that ASC 606 and ASC 842 are uh, very much intertwined and as you assess one standard, you need to assess going forward, both of them combined. Next slide. Last one I wanted to talk about is really the built to suits. A lot of companies, we, we've encountered companies that have built to suit arrangements. And really it says, you know, where less is involved in the construction or design of an underlying asset prior to lease commencement, both the lessee and lessor will need to evaluate whether the lessee obtained control of the asset during construction period. That all obviously requires significant judgment. You know, under the prior guidance, only the lessee considered specific bill to suit guidance. However, if a lessee does obtain, obtain control, it would view the transaction as a financing arrangement rather than a lease. A lessee and lessor would then need to determine whether, if ever, control transfers from the lessee to the lessor and qualifies as a sale and a leaseback. This might actually occur after the construction period is complete. So it's very important as you go into adopting ESC 842 going forward basis that you really consider if you have a built to suit arrangement, getting your technical accounting folks involved early in the process and then obviously getting it accounted for correctly under the new guidance. Next slide, John. So now we really wanted to transfer this and talk to John Scott. As John mentioned, John Scott just joined Bramasol a couple of months ago and his prior role, he actually was spearheading the implementation of ASC 842 at a large healthcare company. And John, we wanted to talk to you a little bit today on, give us some, some feedback on your experience implementing a lease accounting software, if you wait. Sure, you bet. Once again, this is John Scott. Thanks for having me today. As Julio mentioned, primarily my background has been in the big four, but I was recently was a director of technical accounting for a large healthcare company, publicly held, which had about 3,000 leases, 1,000 real estate, 2,000 equipment. So obviously we had to get some software. So the big consideration there was what are our must-haves? We had a lot of joint ventures, like 300. In addition, we wanted to use the software to do a lot of uh, procurement and kind of managerial analysis for, for internal management purposes. So having said that, we, we got it down to two alternatives for we, what we thought were the best alternatives in software companies, had them come do presentation, et cetera. One did a particularly good job because they had a good technical accounting person that knew the software. So we went that way. Now what we didn't consider is the true cost because what, what we thought we were going to pay and the integration and abstraction resources just didn't come along with that alternative. So we had to hire a third party to do the integration, which cost us a significant amount of money, as well as some of the functionality wasn't really uh, came off as advertised. That was kind of the biggest things on at least the software piece. Now, in terms of process, as, as Julio kind of pointed out, we, as a healthcare company, had a lot of potential embedded leases, approximately a thousand of those, because we get a lot of free equipment for services or buying product. Now, that created a, a big analysis, but we also had to go about training our people to identify potential embedded leases, as well as look at those kind of language in those agreements and rewrite them so we didn't have that problem in the future. Additionally, we were one of those companies that didn't have a AP linkage to the software. So, for instance, that's a big problem on real estate leases because what is implemented into the software is the monthly payment and the offset being clearing could be different from what comes through payables because of CAM, uh, rent escalations, or you're paying multiple leases with one payment. Therefore, even though we were a decentralized environment, we had to form a centralized lease accounting group 
to be able to go through and and reconcile all those AP clearing accounts as well as handle questions on potential embedded leases, et cetera. You know, and, and also one thing to keep in mind too is you have to update your rate tables is, as part of, of the process for putting in your software because we got uh, new leases all the time and it might be in between seven, 10 years and you go to the external lenders and get five, 10, 15 year rates, but those have to be continually refreshed. Now, from that standpoint, the biggest thing also was creating separate accounts and being able to track for day two things like variable payments as well as short-term lease payments, which is the required disclosure. You have to capture those in separate accounts and remember to put those on your financial statements. You know, from, from that standpoint, piece that happened on day two was completeness. We thought we had all the leases, but as a result of seeing all these payments come through on the payable system, realized, oh my, we missed quite a few because there was no offset in the software coming through. That's kind of kind of the highlights of some of the bigger challenges, but I would say the cost is a lot more than you think it's going to be as well as the effort. So, so Julio, is there any other kind of things you want me to focus in on or, or no, things of that nature? I just one thing on. I just wanted to talk about one quick topic there, John. So you sure. talk about costs, right? So is it that you were quoted one price and then the full cost of the implementation was, was triple that price? Is that how it worked at your organization? Yeah, I mean, kind of two things there. One is the people we thought were you're breaking up a little, John. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So two things there. One was the, the particularly the person who sold the software to us, as well as kind of the integration resources we thought we were going to get, did not come along with the software purchase. So we had to go to third parties to get that, which was an enormous cost. Secondly, the other challenge was the functionality. I would highly recommend that you run through a lot of things that are important to your or particular leases. For us, it was TV accounting because we had about 200 joint ventures and to make sure that the software could adequately handle that. For others, it might be the currency that, that was mentioned earlier, things of that nature. Thank you very much, John, Scott. We appreciate all your support and uh, we'll be talking to you shortly. John, next Great. Slide. Thank you. Yep, so let's revisit, Julio, that was great. We're going to revisit the day one, day two, but a little bit more from the from, from a different perspective. Go ahead. Yeah, yes, so we just wanted to take a deep dive. This is basically an accounting webinar, so we wanted to take a real, a, just a deep dive into day two accounting. So let's talk about remeasurement. We talked a little bit about it and highlighted before, but basically ASC 842 requires lessees. You have to reassess and remeasure your leases when certain things change. So when you have to remeasure a lease, you have to also remeasure the lease liability, which will trigger an adjustment to the right of use asset. So essentially, whenever you have a remeasurement, you have to do a whole new amortization schedule. You have to do a true up of what was previously booked, and you have to do new accounting going forward, which is not an easy task. And we have to make sure that you have the right software or process embedded to do that correctly. Next. So as we talked about a little bit before, you remeasure if your lease is modified and modification is not accounted as a separate contract. Certain things such as contingencies that are affecting variable lease payments is resolved or simply as a change in your lease term or suppose that you decided that you were not going to exercise the, the lease anymore or suppose that you decided that the amounts probable being owed under a residual value guarantee has changed all these criteria will force you to do a remeasurement. Next. And just very quickly, let's talk about modifications. Whenever you have a modification is when, you know, you and your lessee and your lessor renegotiate a lease term and subsequently you would amend the lease. 
If you're a lessee who wants to extend your lease and there's no extension option in your current contract, or you want to lease more of a particular asset, for example, space in your building, these would require modifications to your lease contract. Lessees and lessors will decide to either modify the current lease or create a separate new lease based on the particular circumstance. However, again, day two accounting, you set up an amortization schedule on January 1st, but if you have a modification, it's going to cause you to create a new amortization schedule and do true-ups. Therefore, we always recommend it's very important that your software can handle this process. Next. The last one we want to talk about is really terminations. When a lease comes to term, the lease liability and right of use automatically reduce to zero. That's because you're setting up an amortization schedule on the beginning of the lease that's going to run to zero. So if a lessee decides to buy out a lease before the lease end, you're going to have a termination. For operating leases, the leases become zero. However, if leases are terminated before the lease term ends, Lessors will have several accounting options based on their specific situations. Again, just we have to ensure that whenever you have a termination that your software can handle it because you might have a gain or loss on your lease. And therefore, it's very important that your software can recognize these terminations. Next slide, John. So thank you, Julio. So no what we're going to do is um, turn it over to Carrie. Uh, Kerry is going to take us through CLM um, a demo and talk about the look of simplification. Hi, John. Thank you. So uh, simplification, I think I uh, vocabulized there a little bit, but really want to, to talk about how some of the complications or the difficulties um, that you've heard so far in this webinar, when you have disparate systems, um, when you don't have an integrated solution like uh, SAP's contract and lease management solution, and um, then kind of look and see what that looks like in, you know, in CLM. So the three areas I want to talk about is, you know, the multi-currency. So um, even if, it, and you might, you know, you never know, you know, the future is unknown. So you may not have contracts now, leases now that require multi-currency, but what's the future? And if you do, how are those being handled in CLM? And then, you know, contract terms and conditions. Um, these are living documents. You know, they, they do change. And then when they change, you know, how is CLM going to be able to simplify this process for you? The funnel, so everything's going into the funnel. Change happens. And really at the bottom here, you're seeing so accounting entries. So SAP, as these events happen, as you're reevaluating, as you got to hit those debits and credits and right of use assets and interest and allocations, all that's being handled um, really automatically with CLM. Okay. Next. Okay. So the first part I want to talk about is and, and show you again, this is um, not a live demo. I just because of time, I wanted to get through as much as I could. So I have screenshots here. So this is Bramasaw's disclosure report that I'm focusing on one contract. So just uh, the 30005 contract there. And um, on the bottom left-hand corner, you can see that these reports um, can run in either the contract currency, the group currency, or your company code currency. So um, go ahead and go to the next slide. We'll take a look at the disclosure report um, based on the pound. So for that specific lease, you're seeing the lease cost for 2019 and for 2020. And again, this is the top segment of the um, report that Julio showed earlier and then just go to the next slide and you know why is this important because you're going to need to track in not only your the contract currency but also in the group currency all your interest amounts your depreciation your lease costs all of your payments and being able to since this is part of SAP your exchange rates are just there I mean they're just being pulled from from your setup in SAP so there's no going back there's no um, reconciling Again, it's just what's currently in your SAP system, and that's what the disclosure reports and what your contract's going to use. Let's go to the next slide. We're just going to run the same report, okay, now on the group currency. So select the group currency, go to the next slide, and again, now you've got that full reporting in USD dollars. Okay, next. 
So Carrie, can I just add, add a quick point there? So Absolutely. for all the for all the accountants on this webinar, I know what you're saying. What about ASC 830, foreign currency? So the good thing about this is that we all know ROUs are a non-monetary asset and, li and liability, least liabilities are monetary assets. What does that mean? That means that for non-monetary assets, we have to keep the historical rate when the lease commenced. And for monetary liabilities, monetary assets, liabilities, we are using the in-period rate. So SAP is going to capture automatically the historical rate when that lease for the RAU asset on the asset side, and it's going to capture on the liability side the reporting rate for the period end. So it's very important. And just to know that when you choose a software, you have to make sure that the software can not only do lease accounting, but you're applying the proper foreign currency exchange rates. It's very critical because if you don't use the right exchange rates, you will not get the proper reporting for your group currency. Carrie? Thank you, Leo. And the next slide is just going into the actual CLM contract. So this is the contract we just saw the disclosure report for. And the bottom right-hand corner, you can see the right of use asset, you know, in the pounds. So um, the next slide is this CLM is taking um, in your the rate, it's taking the term, the interest rate, the conditions, and um, calculating for you all the values that you're seeing here in the valuation cash flow, which is then being used in the disclosure report. So as Julio just said. There is nothing, nothing that you have to do with the integration. You're not trying to pair up two systems. It's just the fact that you have that contract in pounds. SAP is handling all of the um, interest, I'm sorry, all of the foreign exchange for you um, automatically. So simplifying that process. All right, next. So talk about, um, again, change happens. Um, this example that I'm going to give you here is there's actually a change in interest rate, there's a change in the term, and there's a change in the payment. So think about um, if these were known at the time of creating the contract, you would not have to do any reevaluation. The scenario that I'm giving here is that you've got a, a four-year lease that is based on $1,000 a month at 3%. Uh, you've renegotiated with your VC and come back and they've said, okay, we'll drop your rate to $950 a month and 2.9% interest if you add a year to the contract. So because of those events, things have happened, then we've got to go ahead and reevaluate the contract. So next. So within CLM, okay, um, this is where we started with the right of use asset based on uh, 48 months. So you said 48,000 was contract value, present value at this time was 45,292. Okay, and again, we have our depreciation, our interest, our clearing, our repayment, and such. Next. So first thing you're going to see is within the system, um, and actually go ahead and just we'll go through these two. It's just breaking down uh, those amounts in a little bit more detail to show the amortization, John. So okay, again, the $1,000 depreciation, 3% interest rate. So the term was originally 48. I'm just going to restate that if the contract was for uh, five years and 60 months, then we wouldn't be doing the revaluation. But we don't know what we don't know when we're creating these contracts. Um, also, I'm just going in in this example and changing this to 60, uh, to 60 months, changing the date. Up on the right-hand corner, you can see the adjustment and resubmit. Obviously, there's going to be more processes going on as far as approvals, and um, tracking of these adjustments versus what I'm going to be showing you here in this demo. But I wanted to point out that, you know, full audit trail, um, full workflow capabilities and such whenever you, any of these changes are made. So um, there we just go ahead what we showed besides so changing it to, again, 60 months instead of the 48 months. Same thing here. Uh, the unit price was $1,000 a month. Again, because of that renegotiation, we're going to change that to 9 to 150. What you're seeing, these slides, for those of you that haven't CL, you know, seen CLM, um, it really is flexible to account for all of your terms, conditions that are in your contracts, whether it is for um, real estate or any kind of movable assets, as well as fleet, 
mentioned a split or real estate um, on the right hand side where you see a fixed amount. This is a fixed amount of 950, but if I had um, multiple pieces of equipment or vehicles and it was a fleet and a, and a dollar amount per uh, vehicle, then that would be a formula as well as real estate based on square footage. That would be um, a, a rate as well. In this case, you're just seeing a unit price of 950. So it's all time-based. You know, this is SAP, so everything, I'll uh, go ahead and go back, John. You know, everything is controlled um, by, you know, who, what, where, when and date validated. So we have the thousand dollars a month for January 1st, 2018 to April 30th, 2019. And then on May 1st, we're going to go ahead and the rate is changing to 950. Okay, go ahead and next. And so taking right now we've changed the uh, term to 60 months. We've changed the uh, payment from 1000 to 950. And now going into the interest rate, so it was at 3%, we've renegotiated um, a new rate of 2.9. So there's a new period, so I'm going to go ahead and select the new. And then changing that rate from going forward, 5.1 to the next slide, uh, to 2.9. Okay. So by changing those terms, uh, we're going to go ahead and do the reevaluation. Next. Okay. And where before we had, it was around 48000 on our uh, present value in our contract. Now our right of use is 53854 And all of that reevaluation, all of the debits and credits, um, all of the adjustments that have to happen because of those changes, it, they happened automatically. And again, they went ahead and got posted in SAP. So next, taking a look down at the detail. So the bottom as of May 1st, okay, so our depreciation schedule changed. Go ahead and go to the next slide. The remaining value is going to be adjusted. There's our rate now, went from $1,000 to 950 And then, of course, our interest changed from 3% to 2.9. So full reevaluation. Uh, think about trying to track this if you had disparate systems or you oh, didn't have an integrated okay. system. Go ahead, Julio. I was going to say, think about tracking this in Excel. Absolutely. Yep. Well, if you had one contract, it might not be too hard, right? No. <laughs> All right. So let's just go to the next, the next slide and talk about the accounting entry. So um, you know, I mentioned that, that SAP is handling that, all those adjustments, and I just want to go ahead and just show you a little bit of what that looks like. So next. So this was uh, the same contract. And do that, I can go ahead and post um, not only the, we talk about integration with AP, but all of the adjustments are going to get posted, as well all the valuation adjustments that are get posted. So um, this would be a one-off if I was just doing this by one contract. This is going to be, you know, going to be doing these um, in, in batch runs. We're not going to go into individual contracts and doing a post or valuation. Next. And the type of postings that are happening. Um, this is I wanted to show you the fact that you go in and search by um, any of the fields that you're seeing in the posting log. Continue. And I'll try to wrap this up. We have about six minutes. So I'm just going to go through a few of the, again, the postings that are happening in the background automatically. So you have your lease payments. Um, you have your lease expenses from interest. You have your depreciation. So you're seeing on the right-hand side, these are for multiple. I just did a blind uh, search from that prior field, so this is not specific to the contract you dealt to solve. But again, these postings are happening automatically because CLM is just part of SAP. Next. Okay. Um, by selecting any of the documents, so I selected the uh, one 00003 there, and going right into the accounting documents within SAP. Here's another one. Looking at the document of five, you've got the accounting documents, your controlling documents, um, and then your, your um, RE documents. Okay, go ahead and go to the next one. So we're wrapping it up here. Um, so by selecting the uh, accounting document, I'm going right into the, um, the debits and credits here. And again, when I go back to foreign currency, so it's tracking it by the document currency, local currency, and your group currency. And then last, the last example is just if you did have either a buyout or if you had, uh, uh, you know, if an asset was destroyed, and it was no longer part of the contract, 
then this is just showing that last one there that the right of use is actually getting written off and it has to be foreign current happens to be foreign currency in pounds. But then you're writing that asset off and again SAP is going to handle all the additional postings for you. All right. I'll wrap that up. If I could That's just quick, add quick so if I could just add something really quickly there, John. So what you're really seeing here is the complexity of this new accounting standard and you know whether you whether you do it in a system or you do it in Excel, these changes will occur. Leases always are modified. There will be impairments in your leases. There will be a number of changes to your leases. So we always recommend you have a, a robust enough system that's going to help you in that journey because day two challenges are probably more difficult than day one challenges. John? Yeah, thanks, Julio. So let's wrap up, everybody. Um, thank you, Julio, Kerry, John. That was fantastic, as always. Um, and Carrie, that's the first time I've actually uh, walked through a demo, so thank you for that opportunity. Um, in taking away or, or walking away, I want you to think of a few things. We've captured a few thoughts here, um, but I'm going to wrap up with a few more. Uh, here, think about centralization. Uh, you know, are you going to centralize your uh, leasing activity, uh, or are you planning to continue to maintain it as a decentralized uh, model? And it's important to think about that because that has a lot to do with change management, uh, with systems integration, uh, consistency. So beware of that and also beware of the SOX implications. Um, checking the expiration dates, um, you know, th this, there's a lot here. Um, implementing the system is not simply about compliance. So we talk about comply, optimize, and, and transform. But here's an example of simple, simply how compliance can save you money, and the system process does. Checking the expirations of your, your leases, uh, looking for termination clauses, uh, looking at evergreen leases. Um, it's been estimated that companies can save between 5 and, per, five and 10 percent of their lease costs by managing those three to four items. Number one, evergreen leases, termination fees, impairments, uh, and then other expired issues and challenges, cost leakages as uh, we call them. Fine-tuning lease versus buy. Uh, with all of your leases in the same place and within a system that allows you to compare both your leased assets and your owned assets, you have a really great way of balancing uh, your structures, your capital structures, your debt structures, optimizing across the different banking rates uh, and making decisions regionally as to whether it's better to lease versus buy or even sublease. So maybe it makes sense to lease something in one country uh, and then sublease that uh, to another country because the lease buy and the, and the financing rates more, more sense. Um, leverage available tax benefits. Um, again, this is a, a risk management process that you need to look at uh, and how you can take advantage of tax rates, expensing, uh, and again, that of course goes back to your lease versus buy. A couple of things I'd like you to walk away with. We heard from John uh, talking about um, ask the hard questions when you get into a discussion of your lease management software. Think about not just the short term, but the long term. How are you going to deal with integrations? Um, is the staffing that they talk about in their quotes um, just their staffing? Is it the bare minimum staffing? What does it imply to the amount of staffing you're required? And would you have to bring on more? We heard from John, and I know he's got a couple of examples. Uh, where they had to hire on uh, almost as many people, if not more people, just to do more. Uh, finally, you know, also talking about um, you know functionality uh, and long-term integration with your system. So don't underestimate uh, the work that integration will take uh, to get that done. Finally, I want to wrap up with two thoughts as you think about leasing uh, or any of your finance transformation. Number one is comply, optimize, and transform. Abramasol has a framework we call Comply, Optimize, Transform. It's all about creating transactional excellence to make sure that all of your uh, pro transactions are correct, uh, made in a timely manner in accordance with the regulations to allow you to then optimize and do process excellence and finally organizational excellence. <clears throat> the other one that Julio hinted about and we'll, we'll wrap up with this is consider what we'll call the five P's uh, of leasing <clears throat> or any of your compliance, which is your 
uh, policies, procedures, processes, proof. Do you have all of those and how do they relate with your EcoVP and how you're doing all of that from an audit perspective? And finally, and most importantly, it's about the people uh, because this is a process by which uh, you're, you're changing the ongoing processes. So um, it's not just, again, about day one and how did you comply. It's about how do you comply going forward? How do you take compliance to an opportunity to create competitive advantage across your systems? So I want to thank, again, Carrie, Julio, and John for their time. Uh, <clears throat> reminder for you all, please come check us out at Sapphire if you're attending. We'll have our experts there to talk about leasing, RevRec, and Treasury. We'll also be doing a session on central finance, which we believe is a great way for people to take advantage of SAP's S4. Uh, and with that, I'll wrap up and thank everybody for attending and wish you a fantastic day.